he's he's in he says he's in NGO, he's in NGO. So that is an NGO, Dr. Tadudi, academics, most welcome. Dr. Anne Massey from uh, uh, KUTRH, most welcome. Dr. Eric uh, Mwangi, that is KUTRH. Dr. Goral, community pharmacy, most welcome. Dr. Ari, Dr. Francis Maina, most welcome. Whoa, Dr. Wilson Maghetto for 33 years practicing in uh, uh, retail pharmacy, that is community pharmacy uh, in Kisi town. Most welcome, Dr. Ari. Oh, Sister Pauline Congo, uh, working in uh, South Sudan. You most welcome, Sister Congo. Dr. Nelish is in uh, wholesale pharmacy. Most welcome. For those joining us, our esteemed members, just before we begin, uh, we are having this uh, virtual webcast today. I just want to know which sector of which sector are you in? Are you a pharmacist? Are you a medical officer? Are you a pharmaceutical technologist? Are you a clinical officer? Let me know where you're joining, which sector, which cadre are you in? Second, let me know which sector do you practice? Uh, Dr. Huzaifa uh, from uh, Garissa, the medical officer from Garissa. Karibu sana, Dr. Oh, we are, we are much honored to have Dr. Josphat Misango, the MOH Mandera. Karibu sana, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, general practitioner, you most welcome, Dr. Mustafa. Dr. Bitange Pamela, you've not said which uh, which uh, which sector you are from, but you most welcome, Dr. Tari. So we begin at seven o five. You only have one minute. Dr. Magut Alex is uh, from Chebarbar Chemist. Oncology practice, Dr. Arifa. Turabali, Karibu Sana Daktari. Uh, we're already at 400 and we are just one minute shy from 7.05, the official time that we are to begin our webinar for tonight. Dr. Kimaru, Dr. Kimaru Kimadi from uh, Meru County, Asante. Sister Elizabeth, nurse from Marsit. You're most welcome. You're most, most, most welcome. Jackie Kature, a pharmaceutical technologist, most welcome. So ladies and gentlemen, without further much ado, allow me to, allow me to now go ahead and uh, uh, begin our wonderful evening. Uh, first, of, first and foremost, uh, to our senior members uh, of the profession, Dr. Maghetto, 33 years in retail pharmacy, you're most welcome today. Uh, the uh, Honorable Fellows from the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, Senior Members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, Senior Members of Kenya Pharmaceutical Association, Senior Members of uh, Kenya Medical Association who are, who are joining us uh, from today. I want to uh, welcome you to today's webinar, uh, today's webcast. Today's webcast is on, uh, is on insulin. I will not speak much about it because we have wonderful presenters uh, for that today. So allow me to just uh, recognize that today's web, webcast is in partnership with uh, Sanofi. Today's webcast is on insulin initiation, titration, and intensification in diabetes management. Uh, the speakers for today will be uh, Dr. Sokwala. Dr. Sokwala is a, a consultant physician and endocrinologist at uh, MP Shah, at MP Shah Hospital. We also have Dr. Dorothy Ayuak, uh, Dr. Dorothy Sarah Ayuak. Uh, pharmacist and a pharmacy, pharmacy epidemiologist at Kenyatta National Hospital. We also have Mr. Nicodemus Omwango, who will also be, will also be uh, taking us through. He's a medical sales representative from Sanofi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further much ado, allow me to uh, welcome you all in, uh, in, uh, with, uh, with respect to protocol. Allow me to welcome you to today's virtual webcast. Uh, this webcast is... Uh, uh, sponsored and it's courtesy of Sanofi, uh, Sanofi Lantas to be specific. Uh, we're going to be here from 7 to uh, 7.30. We're going to be here from 7 to 8.30. So some few homekeeping rules. First, of, first and foremost, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So we are going to share out uh, on our PSK YouTube page, uh, the recording from this webinar. Second and for, uh, second of it, all CPD points will be awarded. So kindly ensure that you subscribe uh, to the CPD points on the on the PSK portal. For those who are in KMA, I can't send your names 
to KMA side to ensure that you get uh, the CPD points for this webinar. For those joining us from KPA, uh, kindly ensure that and be, be aware that you're going to be sent the CPD, we're going to forward the list of attendees uh, to KPA for awarding of CPD points. Uh, apart from that, you all remain muted during the course of this virtual webcast, and you're requested to drop, to drop your questions at the Q&A tab. The Q&A tab is just below there. You can also drop them on the chat box, but for, for further, for better and uh, for us to better uh, catch your question and better grab, grasp your question, kindly drop it on the Q&A tab. It's on your screen for those using your desktops. It's on your screen below there. Ladies and gentlemen, without further much ado, let me now go ahead and welcome our speakers uh, for today. The first speaker for today will be uh, Dr. Sokwala. Dr. Sokwala, as I had introduced her again, is, uh, uh, earlier on was, is a consultant physician. She is an endocrinologist. She works at uh, MP Shah Hospital. Uh, Dr. Sokwala, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. I am very much with you. Karibu sana, Dr. Uh, it's now my pleasure, it's all mine to uh, leave you the floor to take us to our today's training. Karibu sana, Dr. Thank you very much. So you'll just let me know if you can, uh, uh, if my slide is visible, right? Perfectly well, Dr. It is visible from my end. And it's moving, right? Yes, it is moving, Dr. Yes, so first and foremost, um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya and uh, Sanofi for giving me this uh, amazing opportunity to uh, be able to present on such a wonderful platform uh, for our colleagues. Um, I'm just amazed and impressed at the turnout we are having today. And I hope uh, with the little knowledge that I do possess as far as the insulin aspect is concerned, I know most of you are experts at insulin as a product or as a, as a molecule far better than I am. So what I'll try to do is to take you through the clinical aspect of uh, insulin initiation, titration and intensification. And, and then Dr. Iwak will fill in the gaps wherever I think I'm going to leave them, uh, which I hope will not be too many. So. Um, let us move on. So this is going to be the, the flow of my presentation. We are going to have a very brief introduction. Look at glycemic targets and what is it that we need to achieve for our patients. Look at what are the indications of insulin in type 2 diabetes, because of course we know that type 1 diabetes uh, is dependent on insulin. So there's no question about insulin in type 1. So then the question here is, uh, in type 2 diabetes, when and how should we introduce insulin? And of course, we know all of us that there are a lot of barriers to insulin treatment. We will look at that. Then look a little bit at insulin injection technique, which in detail Dr. Iwak is going to take us through. And if we have enough time, we can also project a small video for everybody to understand better um, insulin injection techniques. Then we will look at what insulin to start and then how to titrate and intensify. So as a very, very brief introduction, what we know is that diabetes has been growing uh, exponentially, and we know that in the latest edition of the International Diabetes Federation, which was released in 2019, which is the ninth edition, and uh, 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 that showed that there were about 463 million adults who are living with diabetes across the globe. And these numbers are definitely projected to keep on increasing, where we are looking at a, a number of 700 million people by the year 2045. Diabetes is definitely a serious problem and uh, we all are involved in one way or another in trying to combat this and to try and uh, you know, not meet up to those expectations or projections that are always there. Somehow the world always overcomes those projections and goes much higher than the estimated uh, values that have been uh, projected. Then we look at what glycemic targets are supposed to be set for different individual patients. And I'll just summarize it into this diagram. So basically every individual patient with diabetes, the whole aspect is individualized care. We heavily rely on individualizing care. It's not like one shoe size fits all. So we have to look at different features of the patient and their motivation aspect to see what kind of target you're going to set for them. So till now, we are still using hemoglobin A1c as our uh, marker for achieving glycemic target in, in patients. And this has been going on for many years. When we look at HbA1c, uh, we see that 
for patients who actually, this is patients who you can do more stringent targets. For most of our patients, we keep a target of less than 7%, but for patients who can achieve a more stringent target, like less than 6.5% without uh, you know, uh, uh, getting undue hypoglycemia, then we aim to achieve those uh, targets for them. Whereas if patients who are like having uh, uh, risk factors which could potentially increase their risk of hypoglycemia and other factors, then you keep a higher target or expectancy, like life expectancy is short, then that's not a patient that you're going to actually try and achieve a target of 6.5%. The factors that you need to consider before, uh, you know, fixing a patient on any specific target or giving the patient or discussing with the patient the specific target that we are setting for that patient, we have to look at these risk factors. So the risks potentially associated with hypoglycemia and other adverse effects of the drugs, if those risks are low, then you want to achieve a more stringent target. If the patient is newly diagnosed, we want to achieve a target of less than 6.5%, and we shall see why we want to achieve those targets. If you have a long life expectancy, a 35, 40 year old gentleman coming to me for the first time with type two diabetes, I would definitely set a more stringent target for them and see how well they can tolerate that target uh, or low sugar levels. And uh, if they have got significant comorbidities, then of course you're going to have a, a, a lighter target or rather a less stringent target for them compared to if the patient does not have significant comorbidities. For example, a patient who has Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or dementia, those are not patients that you're going to now start keeping a target of 6.5% because these are patients who may end up missing their meals who may not know how to inject, you know, or um, how to take their medication, they may overdose. So these are patients, your targets are going to be much less stringent compared to those who actually uh, do not have those type of comorbidities. Again, establish vascular complications. You don't want to have very strict targets. If they've got severely established vascular complications, like things like chronic kidney disease, for example, or end-stage renal disease, those are, not, those are not patients you want to go to very strict targets. Patient attitude and expected treatment efforts. So if your patient is highly motivated, excellent self-care capabilities, then those are the patients you want to go towards the most stringent target. And the otherwise, if the patient is not so motivated, they are poor self-care. And you'll notice, you can know by uh, doing your preliminary assessment of the patient on how well motivated the patients are. Then resource and support systems. Obviously, if you have limited resources, then your targets cannot be that very stringent because monitoring may become an issue. Yeah, And that's also something, especially in resource limited settings that we have uh, in our facilities, we need to consider on, as to what target you're going to set for these patients. So this is very important and we'll see why specifically the glycemic targets are so important. So when we look at the latest guidelines that we have is the American Diabetes Association guidelines for 2021. And the targets that they keep is that um, an A1C goal for many non-pregnant adults, they've set it at less than 7% without significant hypoglycemia. And if you are using ambulatory glucose profile or glucose management indicator, this is very important for all of us to know, even as the pharmacy society, that now we are moving a little away from home, uh, you know, self glucose monitoring and HbA1c alone, and we're actually moving towards something known as time in range. Okay, so this is when uh, you use uh, like continuous glucose monitors, either uh, clinic based or home based, like the flash glucose monitors, um, like Freestyle Libra or others that are available. Which in our country there's still a limited use of those, but we should be aware of them because they are going to come uh, quite soon into our market as well. And this is now when you start talking about time in range. And this time in range means that the range that you set for the patient for uh, the different glucose ranges, which are these ranges which we are discussing, of more than 70% should be within therapeutic range and time below range of less than 4% so that hypoglycemia risk is lowest. So these are the targets that have been set by ADA. If you're doing self-monitoring of blood glucose, then what we want to do is a preprandial glucose of less than 7.2 is a good target and a postprandial glucose of less than 10. But we say for most of our patients who can achieve glucose controls for postprandial, this is about uh, one and a half to two hours postprandial, and this is supposed to be done 
from the start of the meal. So we set targets of about five to eight for most of our patients uh, with a maximum range of 10, that's what we say. And we look at fasting sugars, we set for most of our patients between four to seven uh, millimoles per liter. Individualization, of course, is key. Like I said, tighter targets can be set for younger, healthier adults or individuals and loose targets even up to 8%. And this means that even above 8% for some patients who are older and have got comorbidities. So this is, again, just a summary uh, to show you that these are the kind of targets that you are looking at. Now, remember, this is for non-pregnant adults. Okay, For pregnancy, the targets are completely different. That is not what we are discussing today. Now, this diagram is so crucial for all of us to understand because this is actually the graph is showing the contribution to your hemoglobin A1C of the different type of sugars, that is the postprandial sugars versus the fasting sugars. And you can see that when the HbA1C is higher, then the fasting sugar is contributing more to the HbA1C compared to the postprandial. Whereas the HbA1C, when it is on the lower side, then the contribution is more from uh, postprandial hyperglycemia. So the thing is this, yeah, that uh, it is this, when you understand this, then you understand why the first agent, as far as insulin initiation is concerned, is a basal insulin, because basal insulin controls very nicely your fasting blood glucose, which is more associated with gluconeogenesis, yeah? So that is why you usually start, especially if A1Cs are more than 10, then you'll see that the recommendation is to start a basal insulin. And this is partly the explanation for that. What is interesting is that even in uh, like when you're giving all forms of management, what we know in most developing countries, the target, the individuals, the percentage of individuals who achieve target A1C is still very small, is just about a third of the individuals. And these figures are not so different even in the developed uh, world. Um, between 30 to 40 percent of the individuals end up achieving a target HbA1C, even with the correct management and everything in place. Uh, although the problem with that, the, the main issue why this happens is also heavily uh, uh, related to clinical inertia, which means that a delay in initiation or intensification of therapy in patients with diabetes who are already failing on a particular regimen. So this is very important when you look at what the impact of this HbA1c control or sugar control is in individuals. So they said, okay, fine. Uh, you know, when we have HbA1Cs, um, we, we want to reduce hemoglobin, like sugars in patients. Now, what happens when we actually do reduce sugars in, in uh, patients who have type 2 diabetes? So the, there's the landmark study, that's the UK PDS, which actually showed every 1% reduction of hemoglobin A1C actually led a significant reduction in diabetes-related death of up to 21%. A fatal and of non-fatal and uh, fatal and non-fatal MI by 14%, and this is actually related to. Uh, this was mainly seen in the group which was put on metformin. Um, in the in, in the group that was on uh, sulfur, you know, at that time the only drugs available were sulfonylureas, that's glibenclamide, insulin, and metformin had just been introduced. So that were the the drugs that were used in the in the UK PDS trial. And metformin was actually in a smaller percentage of the population that was studied. And uh, the group that was on metformin actually showed a reduction in fatal and non-fatal MI. Uh, there was a significant reduction in microvascular complications with it, just 1% drop in HbA1c and amputations or death caused by peripheral vascular disorders. And what is interesting is that the follow-up of the UK PDS actually did show um, even after normalization of the hemoglobin A1c between the two groups, that is the groups that were on intensive glucose control and those which were not on intensive glucose control. After the trial, they both normalized. And interestingly, after many years of about 20 years of follow-up, it was shown that the group which had initial good glucose control did continue to have cardiovascular benefits and reduction in cardiovascular mortality uh, and events uh, even many years down the line. So then definitely, for long-term prevention of micro and macrovascular complications, it is important to achieve good glycemic targets. And these are all the studies that have been done. Of course, I'm not going to take you into too much details, but this is the UK PDS that I was telling you. The study that was like, this is the initial trial, and then this is on the long-term follow-up. The initial trial actually showed reduction in microvascular events. Um, 
in the long term continue to show benefits. The cardiovascular profile, uh, cardiovascular risk, risk reduction in the initial trial was not very significant, uh, but the long term follow up did show significance. And the same thing with mortality. However, when we look at this particular trial, which was the ACCORD trial, what it showed is that initially it did show that there was a reduction definitely in microvascular complications with every percentage drop in hemoglobin A1C. Now in the UK PDS, these were relatively younger patients. And these were patients who had got uh, like newly diagnosed type two diabetes with few complications. Whereas in the accord, they chose a very high risk group of people who had uh, like uh, elderly, who had a high cardiovascular risk uh, already existing. They already had complications of diabetes. And then they put these patients onto intensive control to achieve an A1C of less than 6%. And they found actually that there was increased mortality and the trial was stopped. Why I'm taking you into this slight detail is that we need to individualize therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes and glucose control needs to be individualized, taking all those factors into consideration. Then we move to what are the indications for insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes. And to understand this, it's best to understand what type 2 diabetes is. So in the natural history of type 2 diabetes, this is the way it would progress, whereby your insulin resistance keeps on increasing and then reaches a plateau. However, the beta cell function keeps on declining. And they, from the UK PDS, it was shown that there's about a 4% decline per year. And this was there regardless of the type of therapy that was used. And insulin levels also initially go up because there's insulin resistance. So counteractively, your insulin levels go up. So you have hyperinsulinemia initially, and then the insulin levels start to drop downwards as your beta cell function keeps on uh, worsening. And the incretin effect also keeps on declining. This is the effect of uh, raise of blood glucose uh, when you are taking raise of sorry insulin levels when you take sugar. Uh, orally versus when you inject glucose into the system. And it is because of hormones known as incretins, which are produced in the gut, which actually help in increasing insulin production from your pancreatic beta cells. So this effect is disturbed in patients with diabetes type 2, and this continues to worsen over time. And prandial glucose increases thus gradually, and fasting plasma glucose also then continues to increase. And what we know is that before even the diagnosis of diabetes, many patients already have existing development of microvascular and macrovascular complications. And so what we see is that because of this progressive nature of diabetes, although now we know that there are modalities, especially related to weight management and carbohydrate management, which can potentially try to slow down this progress, or rather we call they being labeled as reversal, but reversal doesn't mean cure, is just trying to break down this process a bit slower, I believe, so that your progression is not as the way it would be expected uh, if you are not doing those modalities, like whether it is surgical, bariatric surgery, or uh, weight loss modalities related to diet and uh, pharmacological methods. This is what we are talking about, so that most of our patients, you start with lifestyle modification, so minus oral antidiabetic agents. And because there's a progressive loss of beta cell function over time, then you end up needing to initiate basal insulin initially or premix in selected patients. And we are going to look into the details plus oral antidiabetic agents. Remember many patients I see, they actually chopped off the oral agents once they are started on insulin. And that is not the correct way of doing it. You will still continue on your oral agents, but there are some agents you might end up reducing the dosage, especially when you're looking at sulfonylureas uh, with the course of time. And then you need to, once you have done your uh, basal insulin and your sugars are still not within control, then you need to do titration of the dose to reach or maintain glycemic targets. And then if you are still not achieving control, then you end up intensifying uh, insulin therapy for mealtime insulin coverage. Remember all along when you are doing this, this is always going to remain. That is lifestyle modification at every step of therapy. And that is what we have seen helps patients to keep insulin doses to minimum uh, as for as long as possible. But of course, if they need intensification, then we go to that level. So the early introduction of insulin should be considered if there's evidence of ongoing catabolism 
like if your patient has come with significant weight loss or you do your urinalysis in a patient with type 2 diabetes and there's ketones in the urine, that suggests that there's catabolism going on or there are symptoms of hyperglycemia or when A1C levels are more than 10%, or your blood glucose level at presentation is already very high above 16.7 millimoles per liter. These are the patients you want to in consider introduction of insulin from the start. And then what we do in our setup is then we uh, introduce along with orals this insulin therapy and then gradually try and uh, get down on insulin as we optimize on the orals. But later on, if there is need, then we actually restart this insulin uh, as needed as per this algorithm. This is again the algorithm, which is now the more or less modified algorithm from the uh, from the American Diabetes Association uh, 2021 guidelines. And uh, I'll not go into the details of oral therapy, but you can see that now we are made to individualize therapy, looking at whether your patient has got established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD, or heart failure, and we have got therapeutic options orally for those particular condi conditions. This is only after you have introduced metformin as your first-line therapy and lifestyle modification. So still the guideline mainly focus on introducing metformin and lifestyle therapy, but we have seen that they have indicated that for certain individuals, you might actually start off with a basal insulin, okay, along with oral therapy. Also within the guidelines, there is now a role for combination therapy of oral agents um, uh, in certain con uh, uh, individuals, especially if your A1C targets are above 1.5% of the ones that you are trying to achieve. So if your patient after metformin lifestyle modification is not achieving targets and they have got these risk factors, then you're going to introduce the other agents, SGLD2 inhibitors, GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. And if they are Actually, in this category where they don't have these uh, conditions, then you are going to look if you you have started metformin or combination, you are not achieving target. Then you are going to actually start these other agents. So, if your main issue is you have to try, you have a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia, then you have to look at agents which will not be associated with high risk of hypoglycemia, like the DPP4 inhibitors, GLP1. SGLD2 inhibitors or the thiazolidine dions, and you'll avoid sulfonylureas in this case. When there's a compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss, again, the agents that you'll, you'll use are uh, specified here. And where cost is a major issue, then sulfonylureas still have a role. And so do thiazolidine dions as an add-on initially to metformin, and then you titrate accordingly. Now, here is what I want you to look at. So if you're titrating, if your HbA1c is still above target, then you might want to consider all these options and basal insulin comes in here. Same thing with this aspect. If you are you have given uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists and you're not within target, then you're going to actually move towards basal insulin as we shall see. And the same case in the with the other agents. If you have optimized therapy, you are still not achieving targets, then you move to insulin. And this is how the recommendation for insulin is. Of course, I know all of you can't see this, very well, so I've just uh, um, zoomed it in. So if there is need for injectable therapy to reduce the A1C, so like you have optimized your oral therapy, your lifestyle is optimum, um, the weight uh, management is also being done and all that, but you're still having high HbA1Cs. Now you know that the issue probably is the aspect of uh, beta cell dysfunction or loss. And now you know that you want to start insulin therapy or injectable therapy. So the recommendation from the new guidelines is that you consider GLP-1 receptor agonists in most patients prior to insulin. But we all know how difficult and how uh, costly GLP-1 receptor agonists are as far as affordability is concerned in most of our centers across the country. So what we end up doing is in our uh, part of the world, of course, in private hospitals, we do have the liberty of using GLP-1 receptor agonists. But what we end up doing in most of our patients as well, because even in, in that group of patients, there are very few who can afford and uh, use sustainably the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So we still end up giving them uh, insulin, yeah? So here now you're going to uh, see how you're going to, so GLP-1 receptor agonist, you're going to choose which one and then titrate accordingly. But if the A1C is still above target, then you still go ahead and add a basal insulin. And the choice of basal insulin is based on patient-specific considerations, including 
remember you always have to look at cost okay of the agent and how sustainable it will be for your particular patient to continue using this particular type of insulin now what you'll do is if you are so so this is how they recommend adding the basal insulin so you'll add a basal analog or a bedtime nph insulin so nph is also a basal insulin um which is given uh, which which is available in our uh, in in some of our facilities what i just learned is that nph insulin is available in in quite a number of pharmacies just that i don't think it's available with the um within the government facilities as a standalone um other than as mixed so if you are using your basal um insulin then what they recommend is you start at 10 units per day or 0.1 to 0.2 units per kg per day and then you titrate so the best way of titration is that the patient titrates it themselves and you have to educate them on how they are going to titrate so you are going to set a fasting plasma glucose target for your patient like i said for most patients i set a target of about 4 to 7 millimoles per liter uh, initially and then later on if they have achieved those targets then we try to go down to 4 to 6 but for most patients to keep a target of between 4 and 7 but you have to look at the risk of hypoglycemia obviously and then set that individualized target for the fasting plasma glucose so you are going to titrate your insulin based on the fasting plasma glucose that is your basal insulin now you choose uh, basically what you are going to do is you are going to use some uh, titration algorithm which is more or less the same for uh, most of the algorithms so what what we say is that when you are looking at increment you actually increase by about two units every three days, reach your fasting plasma glucose target without getting hypoglycemia. And if hypoglycemia does occur, which we are looking at sugars of less than four or symptoms of hypoglycemia, which is known as relative hypoglycemia, then you will lower your dose by 10 to 20%. So that's still about, if you look at 10 units, then still about uh, one to two units, right? Um, and then you assess the adequacy of your basal insulin. And this part is very important for all of us as clinicians and as pharmacists and every uh, person who's handling patients with diabetes. There's this component known as over basalization. When you start seeing that you are requiring insulin, uh, your basal insulin, at a dose of more than 0 0.5 units per kg, then you know that that is probably a lot of insulin basal that you're giving and that your patient probably needs an addition of a mealtime insulin. Or the patient has elevated bedtime to morning sugars. That means that at night when you've checked the sugars and uh, compared to the morning sugars, the nighttime sugars are much higher than the morning sugars. That means that you are overusing your uh, basal uh, dose of insulin. And basically it just means that you need to add a bedtime or I mean a dinner time insulin dose, um, the dinner meal, right? Or if your postprandial preprandial ratio is very high that means that your your postprandial sugars are high that means again you have to add a a meal time insulin to control so just to understand and uh, to clarify is like very simply to like this will make us rem hopefully remember this concept is that your basal insulin is going to be titrated using fasting sugars and your pre-meal insulin is going to be titrated using postprandial sugars because it makes sense right you inject insulin at the meal time and you check two hours after food, that is what will tell you that reading that, okay, that insulin was adequate or not. Or if your postprandial sugars on giving all kinds of therapies is still very high compared to the preprandial and you have given full basal insulin, then you know that you need to add a female insulin to control your postprandial sugars, okay? Or there's hypoglycemia, whether it's awareness or unawareness, or there's very high glycemic variability. So sugars are ranging between, four, uh, let's say four to, all the way to 20s, then you know that your basal insulin is not enough and that you need to add. Now, what will you do? So if the HbA1c as well is above target, then again, if you had not started GLP-1, then you're going to start a GLP-1 receptor agonist. But our focus is here. That is when now you start adding your prandial insulin. Usually, you rec we, we recommend that we add one dose with the largest meal or the meal which is showing the highest postprandial glucose excursion. Prandial insulin can be dosed individually or mixed with NPH when you're using NPH yeah, as appropriate. And now we know that um, not in our country, but across the globe, there is availability of basal insulin like Degludec uh, in combination with prandial insulins, okay, like Aspart. So then they do a combined insulin regimen whereby the highest, uh, like the largest meal, then they give that analog. 
But in our setup, you could, if you want to do a mix, you can do mixed insulin along with your NPH, or you can do an analog mix as well if you have to. So, uh, so that's what we are saying is that initiation, you're going to start about four units a day or 10% of the basal insulin dose. And if A1C is less than 8%, you can actually consider when you are adding your prandial insulin, you can consider reducing your basal insulin by about four units or 10% of the basal dose. And then that's initiation. Then titration, you're going to increase the dose by one to two units until you achieve good postprandial sugars as well. So remember, you've already done basal. So your fasting sugar is going to be controlled with your basal. Now you've added prandial, uh, preprandial insulin. So that will now help to control your postprandial sugars. Um, okay, so if the patient was on base bedtime NPH, then you can either consider converting this to a twice daily NPH regimen. And uh, this is similar to what we are doing, but then you'll give two thirds of that MPH in the morning and you'll give one third at bedtime. Okay, and then titrate based on individual needs. Now, after you have done this, now what are you going to do if the HbA1c is still above target? So here you have added one prandial insulin. Now, this is known as a basal plus regimen. Okay, so given basal and one meal. Now you go on to a full, full fledged basal bolus regimen at this point. Okay. So then you'll do a stepwise additional injection of prandial insulin, that is two, and then three additional injections with the main meals, okay? And then that is then known as the basal bolus insulin regimen with each meal. And when your patient is doing um, a, a self-mixed or split insulin regimen, now this is where they're talking about now going towards a mixed uh, insulin regimen, um, which is like a pre-mixed insulin or NPH with short-acting analogs. When you're using NPH and you are giving short-acting analogs, remember you'll end up, if you're doing them separately, you'll actually end up giving about five insulin injections in a day on a full basal bolus insulin regimen. Okay, so this is what the other guidelines also talk about. Like the IDF also talks about starting when you're starting insulin, then starting with the basal OD or a premixed OD or BD. And then on intensification, we are going to do basal plus or basal bolus as we have uh, mentioned. Diabetes Australia actually looks at GLP-1 receptor agonists as well. And they also, this is an intensification. Uh, Canadian Diabetes Association similarly. So most of them are talking about the same to start with the basal insulin. Some of them talk of starting with the premix OD. Now the patients that you'd select to start a premix initially is patients who have got both high fasting and high prandial, postprandial sugars, especially with one particular meal, then those are patients it would be good to give a premix OD. So then what are the barriers to insulin therapy? If you look at it, uh, most patients, they'll come and tell us that the biggest fear, and interestingly, is fear of injections. And this is, of course, because uh, can be overcome because now we've got improved devices, especially the PAN devices. And uh, to, uh, what is interesting is even mixed insulin is available now in PEN devices if, uh, if the patient can, can afford and get access to it. Burdensome regimens, um, you know, side effects of the insulin. Many people are, are afraid of hypoglycemia or weight gain. The biggest problem is therapeutic inertia. This is what comes from us as clinicians, to start insulin and to actually intensify and titrate insulin accordingly. That is because we, we keep on sitting on patients, even if the HbA1c is 8%, we still say, no, let's give it three more months. Let's give it three more months. Whereas we are ending up, uh, you know, hastening the, the uh, decline in beta cell of that particular patient. Poor communication is a serious barrier, especially if the patient does not have access to a good team of specialists who will educate them. You know, the role of the pharmacist is so under uh, reported and under underdone in our part of the world, whereas all this education aspect is left to the educators, which are also very few, or to uh, to the doctors themselves, we, who don't usually have time in busy clinics to give all this information to. So uh, negative appraisals of insulin, like patients are sometimes told, you know what, I started insulin, like a relative will say, you know what, when I started insulin, I mean, or when my, my mother started insulin, she died. Probably the mother was too sick already, had all the complications, and that's the time she was being started insulin. And that is then what happens to uh, uh, patients start fearing that, okay, that is why the patient left. Uh, so this one you can do with nurse-led or pharmacy-led management, improved therapies and uh, diabetes self-management education programs can actually overcome some of these uh, barriers. This is again to divide it further. I think Dr. Uh, Iwak is going to talk in detail about this. So the clinician-based barriers is failure to initiate, failure to titrate, 
underestimation of the patient's need, failure to identify and manage comorbidities, having a reactive versus a proactive approach, so you're starting too late, concern of causing harm, insufficient focus on goal attainment, and insufficient time, like I said. Whereas the patient factors are all these factors. They're worried about side effects, complex regimens, forgetfulness, cost in our part of the world, denial of the disease. Many patients say no. And even when you tell them about all these, even if I give them all the time, they'll still tell you, no, I don't want to uh, start insulin and I'm going to reverse my diabetes and all those things. So absence of symptoms and, you know, diabetes in all patients does not present with features like malaria. So they don't have symptoms and they cannot understand why they need to then start insulin, okay? Health system also has a big role to play uh, in these kind of uh, barriers to insulin therapy. So looking at insulin types and insulin injection techniques, we have multiple types. Again, I'll leave Dr. Iwak to go into the details of the pharmacokinetics of insulin. But just to let you know that the basal insulins that we have in our market is mainly glargine and datamia and uh, NPH insulin as well. And what you can see is glargine has a very good uh, peak profile and uh, exist into the system like for about 21 to 24 hours. Letamir is also good, but it has a, a slightly larger peak. So the risk of hypoglycemia is slightly more um, in, in these patients. And then you've got the human insulins, that is the regular insulin. And then the Lispro, Aspart, and Glulysin, which are the uh, bolus insulins that we give along with the basal. Again, these details, I'm not going to go into, the, into them. You, uh, I think you'd be better uh, spaced at giving, at explaining these um, uh, features of the different types of insulin. Dr. Iwak is going to deal with them in detail. So just to let you know about the basal bolus principle and why we are going towards this basal bolus principle is that generally in your body, insulin is produced in a basal form throughout the day. And then when you eat food in response to that glucose that is taken in, there are peaks of insulin production. And that is what we are trying to mimic with the basal bolus regimen, okay? And this is just, again, a little bit about the insulin injection technique and the pen sizes. Again, I leave Dr. Iwak to take you through that. For most of the patients, we have seen that the four millimeter pen works very well. It's least painful and it's actually uh, does its job pretty well. So these are just some tips for pharmacists, actually, as far as insulin use is concerned. You need to educate patients to label insulin with colored pens or store products in different areas of the refrigerator so that they can understand the different types of insulin. You need to educate them on reading insulin prescriptions carefully. And if they are not clear, then you confirm before you dispense the drug, right? Educate the patient to keep the lid of insulin boxes, that is to keep them in different uh, wallets to avoid confusion. And then you dispense insulin in standard vials if you're using insulin pump. Educate patients regarding appropriate insulin syringe, syringe and pen needle lens. That should come from the pharmacists and also the diabetes educators. Review syringe techniques with persons new to administering insulin. And you basically give them the instructions on how to inject medic medication. And most pharmacies actually should have this instruction sheet to be able to give it directly to the patient, to be able to teach them on how to do subcute medication. What is interesting is even in, 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 um, in uh, private facilities, we do have a challenge with insulin use. And like I said, the role of the pharmacist is quite underplayed in, in our part of the world. And you need to uh, scale up to be able to start teaching your patients on how to use insulin uh, from now on. Yeah. So which insulin to start? The first step we said is basal insulin. Again, this is just more or less repetition. Uh, you are going to continue oral agents and add basal insulin. And uh, uh, you see basal insulin can actually bring up your, your hemoglobin uh, quite significantly and is easy to use and generally quite safe. And the best way to use it is patient-directed treatment algorithms, which have a small risk of serious hypoglycemia, just that your titration is not supposed to be so drastic, okay? So what we know is that treating fasting hyperglycemia actually lowers the entire 24-hour plasma glucose profile. And this is what happens. So this is the normal values. And this is when you are giving basal insulin and the sugars were so high. So overall, it kind of lowers the glucose uh, values throughout the 24 hours. Then you ask which basal insulin to use. So the ideal basal insulin should mimic the normal pancreatic basal insulin secretion which has no distinct peak effect, continued effect over 24 hours, reduce nocturnal hypoglycemia, and have an preferably a once daily administration for compliance with predictable absorption patterns. 
And these are all the long acting insulins that we have. Again, Dr. Iwak is going to take us through this in detail. Then what is after basal insulin? So lifestyle changes plus metformin and other agents, as we said, basal. Now, what do you do? You do titration of your basal insulin, as we said, by one to two units until you achieve your target fasting blood glucose. And then after that, what you're going to do, as we have already talked about uh, the, the titration, two units every three days until you achieve your target glucose. And this is a good algorithm you can set for the patient to attract their basal insulin dose until they achieve their target uh, fasting blood glucose levels. Now, titration we have already talked about. So you've initiated insulin therapy. Um, then you, so the, the way to go about with intensification, titration and intensification is you initiate, you optimize, and then you intensify where needed, okay? With modification of the insulin regimen. So then you're going to do if your sugar is still not within control after proper basal titration, then you're going to do basal plus regimen with the main meal, as we said. And if you still don't have good control, then you're going to uh, basically go now to your basal bolus strategy. Optimize your fasting glucose, add once daily glucose to achieve target A1C and glucose fasting and postprandial glucose ranges. Now, after you have done all this as your basal plus, then what do you do? You move on now to a basal bolus, adding prandial insulin before each meal, okay? Uh, so this is what we are saying, initiation with basal insulin, titration, increased dose by two units, and then intensification, okay? Uh, as we already mentioned, by about four units or 10% before the main meal of basal insulin. And uh, this is just the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of the different insulin regimens. Again, I'll not go into too much details, but this is just to show you that when they compared insulin glargin versus the uh, human insulin uh, NPH, then what was shown in these trials is that the required dose to achieve target HbA1c in, uh, in most patients was much lower with glargin compared to with premixed insulins. Symptomatic hypoglycemia was also significantly less and also weight change was significantly less. Of course, insulin does intend to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, does increase weight because of the, uh, the, the mechanism, you know, it's an anabolic hormone. But with uh, glargine, the weight gain was not as much as with premixed insulins. And the same thing was more or less shown in all these trials. So again, this, I think I've already said, you keep on increasing by two units every three days until your postprandial plasma glucose is achieved. This is now for your, uh, bolus regimen, okay? And so these are just to show you the guidelines on insulin uh, intensification and which patient profile will favor a premix insulin versus which one will favor a basal bolus. You have started your basal. Now you want to know what to go towards. So if your patient, so you look at patient preference regarding injections. If the patient is not comfortable with many injections, then you'll of course go for a premix. But if your patient is okay with injections and their meal times and you know they are quite flexible, then you can go with your basal bolus regimen. If the patient does not want to monitor very frequently, they, they're not that motivated to monitor their sugars, then of course you'd go for a premix insulin. Whereas if they're comfortable with frequent monitoring, you'd go for a, a basal bolus regimen. If the patient's ability to inject, their cognitive ability is not good, and then you'll go for fewer injections as required, then of course you'll go for a premix regimen, whereas if that's not the case, then you would actually do a basal bolus regimen. Again, what we don't have here is meal patterns. So if your patient is having a regular meal patterns, then premixed insulin is preferred compared to, uh, I mean, it's you, you they can use Premixed insulin versus a patient who is having erratic meal patterns, so that those are the patients, then we will uh, go for a basal bolus regimen. Again, looking at intensification from OD to BD dose of uh, insulin, it is if you are using a uh, mixed insulin, okay, from OD to BD. So sometimes you can actually start with an OD premixed insulin, and um, either you can divide the dose equally between breakfast and dinner doses. Um, and then you titrate the dose accordingly. If you are on orals, then these are the, the recommendations that by the time you are going to a BD dosing, you usually need to either half the dose of the sulfonylureas and then eventually discontinue sulfonylureas. Metformin continues, remember, yeah? And let, uh, depending on your patient's profile, you might uh, consider stopping your uh, thiazolidine diones, okay? Whereas now, if you want to intensify further and you want to move to a PID. You can actually go on a mixed insulin to a 
three times a day dosing of insulin, then that is again a lot of more detail. I think by the time you're reaching there, the consultant has already uh, done all the work. So these are some causes of failure of our usual treatments. Failure to improve glucose control after adequate dose titration because of presence of comorbidities, prior control difficulties, occurrence of hypoglycemia and uh, adherence, okay? Excessive weight gain is another cause of failure, high insulin requirements in the obese person and um, nocturnal or daytime hypoglycemia. And this will bring me to my conclusion. So uh, many patients will more or less ultimately need insulin therapy alone or in combination with other agents to maintain glycemic control. The most convenient strategy for initiating insulin is starting with a single dose of basal insulin. And then you should consider prandial insulin when significant postprandial glucose excursions occur, starting with a meal with the largest excursion. Mixed insulin can be used as initiation or titration in selected individuals, and side effects need to be addressed accordingly. So uh, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. If we have time at the end, we might show you a video. Uh, it's actually a video on insulin injection techniques, but I think I'll hand over now to, um, to, 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 the, to the rest of you. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Sokwala. Asante Sana, thank you very much uh, for your wonderful presentation. I won't say much about that, Asante Sana. Uh, my lecturer is here, Dr. Uh, Dr. Monica Carrara. She probably says that now I, I, I need to be probably an expert in diabetes because I have, I have now undergone a retraining in, uh, a retraining in diabetes. Asante Sana, uh, Dr. Sokwala. So probably you can stop sharing so that we can uh, now allow Dr. Uh, Dr. Yuak To share as Dr. Yuak shares, uh, we still I, I still remind you our dear uh, esteemed attendees for today. I remind you that this webinar is being recorded. We shall share the recording after 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 the webinar, and it's going to be shared on the PSK YouTube page. Also, to remind you is uh, that we are going to share the CPD points after the after two two weeks after the event. But for KPA, KMA, and Nanak, we are going to share the attendance list over uh, to that side. Uh, my sincere apologies, uh, Dr. Dorothea Yuak. Uh, we refer, she, she was referred on the poster as Dr. Sarah. Our sincere, my sincere apologies, Dr. Tari, for that. And uh, hope you are ready now, Dr. Tari. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Kar Karibu sana, Dr. Tari. I can see your colleague, uh, your colleague, Dr. Irene Meru is here with you and probably your mentee, Dr. Uh, Anita Mushua is here with you. Dr. Uh, Tari, take it over from us. Thank you so much, um, Bao, and thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Sokwala. You are, uh, it is quite enlightening, and it's also going to help to ease uh, as I move on to this uh, next presentation. So I just say it because I've been baptized a new name, a very lovely name from my predecessors. Dr. Sarah Agak was a previous HOPAC secretary, so I want to assume that that is why there's a lot of confusion. So to save bandwidth, I'm going to request that you just allow me to uh, not do the video because it's even dark area i'll not do the video and just uh, work with the sound but i'll keep i'll put it on that q and a time uh, it's okay dr you can go ahead Dr. so we are going to look at uh, uh just uh, briefly what is the pharmacy's role in optimizing outcomes and i want to appreciate dr sokwala for just taking us through uh, initiation titration intensification and uh uh, now my slides are not moving. So we are going to just have an overview of, um, uh, okay, finally. Uh, we are, I'm just going to take you just briefly to an overview as highlighted what is insulin, the indication we have, it has already been covered, just a brief on the types of insulin, the action, and then what I find will be the key message, the five M's that matter when it comes to insulin. So just to start off, what is insulin? Insulin is a hormone. It's released from your pancreas. That is, uh, I hope my pointer is showing, that's where your pancreas is located, quite near the liver. And insulin is produced by the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans. hands. So those who are just from school recently, I think that is uh, familiar. So how does insulin look like? Insulin is a biologic uh, agent. So it uh, has two chains, a chain A and B, and they are linked by disulfide chains. And so now the importance of uh, when we and um, uh, when we think of insulin as a biologic, then there is uh, what comes in terms of um, uh, uh, storage, 
and also appropriateness of use and also the challenges of um, what could happen in case of an error because we also list insulin as one of the high alert medicines and you'll find a number of the biologics you need to be careful in terms of how you handle them and therefore it's important to just be to keep that in mind so insulin is important to control the plasma glucose this by suppressing your endogenous glucose production by the liver and stimulating the uptake of glucose by muscle and tissue and this is just a diagram too i think a picture is a thousand words it's just a diagram to just uh, uh, internalize the role of insulin your insulin produced by the pancreas which comes now to make sure that the liver can ensure that you can uh, stop it stops the liver from producing more glucose it stops the fatty uh, adipose tissue from breaking down fat to fatty cells but instead it promotes the muscle to take up the glucose so that in fact you actually reduce the amount of glucose that you have circulating well when do we use insulin it has already been highlighted it's used in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes it can also be used in the impaired glucose tolerance in pregnancy Generally, metformin is what is accepted, but you know, sometimes uh, this half of the patient, about 46%, will tend to require insulin at some time, either the NPH or the, um, uh, here, or the base of insulin. So, and, uh, or detamid. Now, uh, it's good to note that in pregnancy, you will not use insulin glycine if you need a, a basal form of insulin. You can also find insulin indicated when there's acute illness or surgery and surgery in people with diabetes. So if we go straight to looking at the types of insulin, we look at the, we can look at them in terms of the classification of in terms of are they human insulins or are they analog insulins? The newer molecules are the analog insulins. The human insulins are classified again further into short acting, intermediate and biphasic. The analog insulins are also classified according to their duration of action. Now here you have the rapid acting so you, you find them taken during mealtime. The long acting, what we are talking about, the basal insulin, the biphas biphasic, that means it's a combination. It's like the equivalent of the premixed in the human insulin. And the ultra long acting, in this case, uh, the glagine is actually the, what we say, the true long acting agent. If you look at insulin classification in terms of five broad types, not as uh, human or um, analog, then now you're looking at it based on the duration of action. There's a rapid, short acting, intermediate, long acting, and then the premixed or biphasic. So when do you use which type of insulin? When you're interested in mealtime replacement, you're going to select a rapid or short acting insulin. Remember the short acting are in, uh, human insulins. So these uh, most public facilities might find you only have the human insulin. So for mealtime replacement, you're going to use a short acting insulin. When you want to replace uh, basal insulin, the ba basal insulin replacement, you're looking at intermediate acting. So if you only have the human insulin, that's the NPH. Uh, for the analogs, you have the long acting or ultra long acting. When you want to do both meal time and basal replacement, as I want to hope that you are in keeping in mind what uh, Dr. Sokwala has taken us through, then you're having here the premixed stroke by basic insulin. So what, how, how do these uh, various types of insulin differ? The rapid acting, remember we say these are mealtime replacement. They tend to work within 10 to 30 minutes. And this, uh, the duration depends on the brand, but roughly uh, it's good to know that within 10 to 30 minutes, you'll have the onset of action. And they'll tend to pick between half an hour and three hours and last in the system three to five hours. For the short acting, remember these are the human insulins. They will take longer. They will take anything between 30 minutes to one hour. So we find that the advantage of having rapid uh, acting insulins is that for someone who will not be able to predict at what time they'll take their meal, will they take their breakfast at 7 a.m. every day or they, depending on the nature of their, of their um, work, they can't really be able to determine at what time they will be able to take their meal. So a rapid acting becomes uh, dependable because it allows you to at least 10 or even 15 minutes before the meal, you can be able to plan your life around that. And the duration of acting for both uh, for short time, uh, short acting insulins are two to four hours. So it's uh, almost uh, similar. It takes longer to peak and it lasts in the system four to eight hours. Sorry, I need to go back. Last in, your, in the system four to eight hours. So you see when you're dealing with short acting insulins that they will stay in the body for uh, 
much longer than the rapid acting, especially when you're considering the uh, post the pre meal insulin that you need to give. Intermediate acting, this will be again the human insulin. They will take two to four hours to act for onset of action and last in the system for peak at within four to ten hours and last in the system anything to ten to eighteen hours. For the basal insulin, remember our discussion today, we're looking at when you're initiating, uh, when you're managing the patients, you are not able to control them on oral and uh, agents, anti-diabetic agents, and therefore we initiate the long acting. So how long does it take to work? Within one, one and a half hours, or so for some four to eight hours. Uh, within one to 1 1.5 hours, you'll have onset of action. And then they will stay in the body for Oh, sorry, they'll stay in the body for anything between 11 and 24 hours. Now, we have two common long-acting insulins in the market. We have the Detemir and the Glagin. Glagin actually will say 24 hours, but you can have even the action slightly over 24 hours. That's why you find with the ultra can be sometimes referred to as the ultra long-acting insulin. For pre-mixed Again, we say this is a mixture of both a short and uh, long and uh, intermediate or rapid and long acting. So you'll have onset of action within half an hour to one hour. Uh, and in the case of when it's adult analogs, you can have it even within less than 15 minutes. And how long will it last in the body? 10 to 18 hours. So it's important to take note of that because when you're going to be helping the patient in terms of self-monitoring their blood glucose, and they are taking the insulin, you also need to be able to let the patient be aware to even document if you're reviewing them. At what time did they take their insulin so that you know, was that insulin actually in the system at the time they were taking their blood sugar so that you, you can help you gauge the, uh, how, whether the dose was optimum. And that ties into what Dr. Sakwala has mentioned about initiating and, and titrating the dose. So this has been highlighted. When do we give the various insulin uh, therapies? For basal insulin, they tend to be given once, but sometimes can be given twice a day. Premix can be given any time between once, twice, or three times daily. Remember, therapy has to be also tailor-made to the patient. The rapid-acting insulins are our mealtime insulin. So you'll be given around 15 minutes before a meal, then we have the combination. Yeah. So if we look at the long-acting insulin, we have two which are available in our uh, in most of our facilities. We have the Lantus, that's the insulin glagin, and we have the Detamir, that's the Levemir. So how does the do they come presented? We have in our facility we have the glagin in both a vial and as a pen. Remember, sometimes because of cost issue, it might be cheaper for the patient to have the vial. But then again, remember to help uh, the patient be able to accept therapy and to uh, fit in their lifestyle. It, uh, if somebody is busy, it'd be a lot easier to move around with a pen than with a vial. So again, you have to think about customizing therapy based on the patient that you're handling. So yeah, we've talked about basal insulin. So what really is basal insulin? This is the background insulin, and it's the insulin which you require to keep your blood glucose levels stable even during periods of fasting. So it doesn't mean that just because someone is not eating or even if it is uh, fasting during the Ramadan period that they will not have any uh, glucose circulating in the system. So you need a little background insulin to be able to keep your glucose levels stable. Because we know that even, and, uh, and usually in the normal um, uh, person, if you are not diabetic, your liver usually normally secretes glucose into the bloodstream. So even for the diabetic, if there's not sufficient insulin to take it up, then that glucose will be able, will end up um, uh, increasing in the bloodstream. So you need to be able to have basal insulin to keep that under control. And for diabetics, then they will actually require that background insulin. This is a chart that had been highlighted to earlier to be able to just help us appreciate the difference between the different types of insulin. For the rapid acting insulin, what we said, that they will peak quite fairly fast and also come out of the system fairly fast. So we have aspart, lispro, glulysine as the rapid acting. Then here, what we call the regular insulin is our soluble insulin, the short acting. You see, it will take a little bit longer for the peak and it also stay in the system longer. The NPH would be now the version of the longer acting, but it's an intermediate acting insulin. 
um, like some uh, insulated in some facilities, you may find that brand in your facility. So that is a NPH and it will also try to give you almost a flattened curve, but that is your intermediate acting. Then we have the Detamir and Glagin, which are the long acting. As you can see for Detamir will peak, but it will also not last in the system as long as the Glagin insulin. So this has been highlighted by Daktari when you're looking at when you're initiating therapy, at what dose do you start at? And um, uh, whether it's a newly diagnosed, it, a naive, a patient who's on NPH. So that has been highlighted. So what I want to focus on is particularly the five, what we say, the five M's that matter for timely insulin therapy. Here, I'll go through them so that uh, we appreciate. First, we need to match. We need to match the insulin to the patient. You have to consider how is the patient? What are their attitudes? What are their wishes? What do they desire? What did the physician assess about this patient? So when we look at a patient who uh, they will require, if uh, I look at um, uh, frequency of the regimen, a patient who will not want to take uh, insulin often, they, they'll be more comfortable with once daily injection. They are too scared of having several injections. Then now you're looking at a once daily option regimen, and that is your basal insulin. If they are willing to go through, uh, uh, they, are, they are not uh, scared of injections, then now you can consider therapies which have either premixed or the basal plus regimen or the basal bolus. Remember, at the basal, you're going to be giving background insulin, you're going to be giving mealtime insulin. So that means every time they're going to take a meal, they need to remember. So that depending on how often they eat, then now that will dictate how often they will require an injection. When I'm looking at glycophenotype, it's, it's the you're considering the patient's uh, clinical assessment based from the physician's review and also the biochemistry. What is the problem with this patient? Is their fasting glucose very high or is it both fasting and, and uh, postprandial glucose that are very high? So one who the problem is the fasting glucose, you're going to fo focus a lot on the basal insulin. Uh, so you're looking at the dosing of the basal. But when it, both the fasting and post-meal uh, glucose are very high, you're going to look at the premixed and uh, or basal plus regimen or basal bolus regimens to manage that patient. Then you also consider, is this patient at high risk of hypoglycemia? If they have low risk of hypoglycemia, you can comfortably give the basal insulins. But if their risk moves now from low to moderate or high, then now here, if you're thinking a high risk patient, a high risk of hypoglycemia, then you're going to have to give the insulin at the time that the glucose is high. So here they'll be on those basal bolus regimen. Then you think of the motivation. As that has already been mentioned, there are a lot of patients who are scared of injections. So if they are not, if they are scared of injecting, that means you are not going to give them a regimen that will they will be injecting themselves often. So you're going to stick to the basal, which will probably give once a day. If they are uh, able to monitor and they are motivated, then now you are able to go through other regimens which require uh, more frequent injections. Then you ask, uh, come to the second M of motivate. You need to have the patient willing to accept the insulin. And now here I'll use the acronym WATER. When you're talking to the patient, well, unfortunately, sometimes because of the either the structure of the pharmacy or the um, the number of clients you have to serve, you may find that you don't have enough time to explain, and you may trash through her when you're dispensing or uh, reviewing a patient who is on insulin therapy. But I encourage you to just go through just very quickly. Uh, using the water acronym, how you're going to go about uh, encouraging the patient, motivating them to be able to stick to their regimen. For starters, you welcome them with warmth. It's good to let the patient feel welcome, even if there is a large crowd of patients. Find out if they have any complaints. So you ask, do they have any complaints? How are they feeling? What was their glucose, uh, uh, their blood sugar chart uh, sh reflecting? I think last week we looked at glucose monitoring for those who had joined the PSK session. So you can be able to encourage them to tell you a little about the glucose uh, chart uh, to help them assess their medical status. Then you need to also tell the truth while counseling. You'll not tell the patient that um, when they take the insulin, that will be the end of their, that they will take the insulin for a defined period of time. So if the patient is supposed to be on insulin for lifetime therapy, let them know that they'll be on insulin for lifetime therapy. Will they 
uh, required to stop the other oral medication. If they don't, if they are not going to stop the oral medication, and they uh, they think the insulin is a solution, don't tell them that insulin is the only solution. You let them know they will require to continue the other therapy, or you tell them which therapy will eventually be stopped. And uh, there are some who will say, "I'll not want to take insulin because it, the injection is painful." So you'll not tell them, "No, it's not going to be painful." You just encourage them. What other uh, if uh, uh, maybe it's the choice of the syringe or the injection technique. So just let the patient, uh, tell the patient the truth about their therapy, uh, what it is it's going to involve because they will need to be committed to be able to adhere. Then also explain with empathy the need for the insulin. As sometimes, uh, I, okay, I'll give an example of my father who was told that if he doesn't take the insulin, he will just die. So we have, uh, what we say, we need good bedside manners or rather good... Um, over the counter or table side manners when we are dealing with the patient. Just explain to them why they will need it. Don't make it um, sound like the voice of doom. And then also reassure them and ensure that they come back for their visit. Remember, this is a chronic illness, so they need to come back and be monitored. Then we look at the method for injection. Remember, you've matched, given them the right insulin, you're motivating them. Then you need to be able to demonstrate to them the injection technique. And I hope we'll have a video on that. And you need to know that when we have the wrong technique, then there'll be unwanted complications and uh, from as a result of that. And also it's going to make the injection pa painful. It's, you also need to be able to continue to incorporate insulin injection technique in the clinic visit. So if it has not been reviewed at the time they, they were seen by the doctor, just take that chance and ask, please just remind me how you're injecting your insulin, which areas are you using, how long have we, we have our patients who they don't want to... Uh, buy a new syringe uh, too often. So you can just find how long have you kept your needle uh, uh, so that because sometimes they keep the needles until they are so blunt that now it introduces pain. Then you also emphasize again, what are the injection sites? So now that uh, uh, what is highlighted in the diagram you have around the abdomen, that's one. Then you have the thigh areas, both the front and the back of the thighs, that's two. Then you have the upper arms, three. So familiarize yourself, where do they inject? So if you find somebody's injecting in the wrong area and you also encourage them to rotate around, let them not stick to one area for injection. Then now when you're looking at the insulin technique, the injection technique, just there are certain things that uh, um, I highlighted that are important to be able to go through the patient. Find out, do they clean the injection site and their hands even before they go about injection? Then also remind them, what are the, prop, the preferred injection sites? Then when you're looking at the needles, the smaller needles are better. So the, when it's a pen needle, it's a four millimeter. When it's a syringe needle, they're six millimeter. Remember we have syringes for the vials and we have pen needles for the uh, uh, pen devices. So remember that the needles will be different depending on the device. Then also encourage self-inspection of the injection site and screen for high, uh, lipo hypotrophy. So now you encourage them, let them check, let them palpate themselves, let them examine to make sure that they, in case they notice that they are some, uh, there is hypertrophy, that they, they need to move from that site and also let the, the doctor check them. So inspect palpate injection sites at least once a year and more often than not, you'll find hypertrophy is detected. Then as much as possible, do not reuse needles or share the pen. So we encourage them. If they are two diabetics, uh, we say uh, sometimes we find a couple and they are both diabetic. So say uh, they go to and yet water. So even if they are from the same high household, you want to encourage them to have their own set of needles and pens and cartridges. And ensure that now when it comes to disposal, we don't want them throwing this with the rest of the trash. Teach them how to dispose. So if you're going to get an empty bottle where they're going to be putting the needles, inside and then close so that now even those who are collecting the rubbish and even those who are handling the garbage within the household are not exposed unnecessarily. Then we monitor the, the glycemic parameters among and others. So you support the physician in monitoring therapy. So the monitoring therapy should be individualized based. So a patient who on the insulin regime maybe is on base, uh, basal bolus, you know they will need to keep on monitoring the insulin a lot more uh, uh, their glucose a lot more frequently. Those who are at high risk of hypoglycemia, you need to be careful. Also, you're thinking, has the patient achieved target? So you're monitoring to make sure that they're achieving target. And also, don't monitor just for the sake of monitor. You need to be able to build capacity for the patient to be able to act on that data. So when they say they are off range, what are they supposed to do? 
Daktari has uh, gone through a slide and say, uh, how much do you increase the dose of the insulin by? So encourage the patient also not to just document for the sake of documenting, but so that they can be able to act on that data. Then, uh, sorry. then we look at the therapy. Uh, how can we go about monitoring? You can uh, monitor uh, glucose using either lab day based data. So you will have them come to the lab they are tested or they can self-monitor or where you have a continuous glucose monitoring system for the facilities which have that uh, available, then that is something that you can you can uh, utilize. And then for and HPA1C, we recommend that this is done uh, at least every three months, but it depends also on affordability. Then also think about, the, let the patient uh, also monitor by looking at what is the, do they feel is their quality of life since they started therapy. How do they feel? Are they uh, feeling more uh, comfortable if they were uh, fatigued or they were starting to have signs of complications? What can they report in terms of their quality of life? So you don't have to work uh, uh, only with the laboratory based or uh, glucose monitoring, uh, uh, using a glucose monitoring devices. They should also tell you how do they feel? How do they feel in terms of treatment satisfaction? Are they feeling that they are in control of their therapy? Are they feeling like they are not suffering from a lot of hypos? Are they not having a lot of uh, hypers in terms of their glucose is out of control? So what do they say in terms of treatment satisfaction? Then when you look at the regime, diabetes management is a dynamic exercise. So you need to keep on uh, checking what is Sorry, you need to keep on checking and re-evaluating and adjusting the treatment accordingly and work together with the physician to be able to modify the therapy. Alert the physician, sometimes we have patients who are too scared to let the physician know that the things are not going well or they cook their fingers on their book. If they are coming self-reporting, they might just cook their fingers so that they are not uh, yelled at or they feel too scared to confess that they have been having issues. So support the physician when they try to modify therapy. Remember, dose titration is based on the symptoms, the glucose monitoring, among other investigations. And then revise the regimen. You consider when you're looking at the choice of the preparation or delivery uh, device, it needs to be, you let them know that sometimes you may need to modify your treatment. We may need to give you a different device because uh, maybe you're not, uh, you're having difficulties. Uh, if it's somebody who cannot be able to accurately measure with a syringe, that's a person whom you may need to tell them they may need to invest in a pen because as they dial the, the units, they can be able to hear. So when you're looking at modification, what is going to guide how, what you modify? So when do you require to titrate the dose? If you find that the patient is having a deviation, a mild deviation from glycemic target, or maybe it's a newly started regimen, then you know that dose titration will be required. Sometimes the change of preparation is required, whether it's from human to analog, log acting to ultra long acting, premix to dual action, confirmation, low dose premix to high mix. So when will that be required? That will as the same again when you find that there's a deviation from the glycemic target, or you find a patient is unwilling to increase the dose frequency, so you may need to use a different, a different um, insulin type because the patient will not want to dose themselves as frequently. And also remember that the, because of glycemic variability, patients will respond differently, so you may need to change the pre uh, preparation. Also, uh, in modification, you can look at changing the injection frequency. So maybe it could be vessel plus one, meaning that you're taking the vessel insulin plus one rapid acting or plus two rapid acting. So this will be tend to be done when there's a gross deviation from glycemic uh, targets. Or you have isolated incidences of postprandial hyperglycemia, that post-meal hyperglyc hyperglycemia. So now in that case, you need to uh, change the frequency of therapy. When will you need to change the regimen? Either you are having basal to basal plus or to premix or vice versa. Again, if you have gross deviation from glycemic target and the post meal hyperglycemia. So as we get to the end, what to say it is important that you also need to educate the patient on the devices they use. Uh, majority of the patients are on the insulin, it might be on the using the syringe, so it might be easy for them to use, but a pen might be a new device, so you'll need to be able to demonstrate this. And uh, I want to believe that Nicholas, Nicodemus is going to take us through this. So thank you. I will hand over the meeting to, to 
Bao. Hello, Dr. Yoak uh, Asante Sana. Thank you very much for the wonderful the wonderful presentation. So we we left with nine minutes, but I will, I will, I will beg for your indulgence, our dear attendees, for tonight. So probably I will move this meeting. I'll request us to probably give ourselves till eight forty-five eh, for tonight. Kindly bear with us, because uh, we surely uh, this, uh, this is a meal before us to partake, and we cannot partake this meal partially. So allow me. We have only two more speakers. We only have one more speaker. That is uh, Nico Mwango. Just before Nick sets up, eh, uh, Doctor Doctor Sokwala, are you able to share the video? Do we have the time to do that, you are sure? Ah, okay, Dr. Ari. So let me, let us, let Nick uh, share the, uh, share his screen. Uh, Nick, over to you. So if we have time towards the end before 8.45, uh, we'll probably, uh, if it's before 8.40, we'll probably have uh, to, I will share the video as we close. So ladies and gentlemen, without further much ado, allow me to welcome none other than Nick Omwango. He is a medical sales representative at Sanofi. Nick, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. I can you back on phone? Can see my screen? I can see your screen, Nick. Then you, I can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead, Nick. Take us over. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sokwala and Dr. Iwak, uh, for the elaborative uh, uh, presentations. So, my job today actually has been made easier because I'll just take you through uh, the role of lanterns in uh, diabetes uh, management. As you have heard, my name is Nico Mwango. I work uh, with Sanofi. So, I look, briefly look to, through the efficacy and safety of lanterns, uh, the various lanterns formulations and dosage, and also the availability and partnerships that we have uh, currently. Now, Lantus, uh, the molecular name is insulin glycine, and it has been there in the market for over 20 years now. And um, my hope is that by the end of this presentation, you'll be more comfortable to actually use Lantus and benefit your patients with them, with it. So uh, this has been uh, highly discussed, the UK PDS study, and uh, we, we know why actually uh, one of the reasons for starting insulin early is because of the decline in beta cell function. So at, at some point in time, you'll basically need uh, to intervene uh, with, with an insulin uh, formulation. So th this has been found according to UKPDS and large randomized studies that uh, early intensive glycemic control reduces uh, long-term uh, diabetes uh, complications. So this, uh, you might look at it in terms of uh, uh, impacting the patient in terms of cost effectiveness. So the other, uh, you, you, you might preserve it uh, for later, but remember that also you might actually, they might actually need, uh, it may be more costly to treat the patient in the long run. So <clears throat> when it comes to um, hyperglycemia, also Dr. has discussed this, this that uh, with the increase in high H1C, you'll find that uh, the contribution of fasting plasma glucose tends to be more. So it uh, just makes sense that whenever you're managing such patients with high H1C, that you fix fasting first. And uh, the recommendation is that uh, you, you actually fix it or manage it with a basal insulin. So we have seen several studies um, that are advocating uh, for basal insulin, also guidelines advocating for use initiating with basal insulin. So the take home message is that uh, if you are to initiate an insulin, uh, you start with a basal insulin. And even the current uh, Kenyan guidelines, that is also the same recommendation. And then uh, the, the rest, I think they have been taken through by uh, Dr. Sokola quite elabor elaboratively, so I won't uh, talk more about it. Now let us look at the efficacy of uh, once daily lantus. Remember lantus is a once a day uh, insulin regimen. So it has been found according to Gastein that uh, on average, uh, it has been found to reduce uh, H1C by 1.6% at uh, six months when used uh, with metformin, uh, an SU for instance, uh, amaryl or both. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, this has been sustained over uh, more than six years. So you'll find that with lantus, your patients achieve uh, blood, uh, actually achieve uh, glycemic control, and this is maintained in the, in the long run. Now, when you look at safety of uh, lantus, uh, according to the research, which is a study, it found that up to 45% of patients uh, who are on lantus and metformin achieved H1C of uh, less than 7% without a single hypoglycemic episode at six months of treatment. 
So you can, uh, you can confidently administer Lantus to your patient, we, uh, knowing very well that your patient won't actually have um, an increased risk, risk of hypoglycemia. It actually has a minimal risk in terms of hypoglycemia. When you look at, uh, in terms of uh, um, cardiovascular outcomes, it has been found to be actually cardioneutral and does not affect the cardiovascular outcomes on patients. So it has a long-term cardiovascular safety uh, data. Now, why, why Lantus is, is actually recognized as a 24-hour insulin is because once injected into the body, it forms uh, micro precipitates, uh, which uh, forms depots that are continuously released uh, into the bloodstream for over uh, 24 hours. So uh, can, you can say that Lantus is the only and uh, uh, the only 24-hour insulin uh, that we have uh, in the current market, and uh, you can conveniently administer it as a once a day uh, insulin. Now, how does it compare with uh, the various uh, insulins that you have in the market? This is just uh, an illustration of a premixed insulin, what happens. Uh, remember, premixed insulin uh, uh, is given as a twice a day uh, injection. So you'll find that uh, at, when you give, uh, for instance, at uh, breakfast, because uh, it has two components, that is uh, the, uh, the NPH uh, and also the short-acting insulin, you'll find that the peak times will be different. I remember that uh, for NPH it tends to peak at uh, four to six hours, while the short-acting tends to peak uh, between two to four hours. So you'll find that uh, the two will peak uh, uh, just before lunchtime. And uh, if the patient does not snack, you'll find that uh, they might elapse to hypoglycemia. And even when you give it at dinner, the period between lunch and dinner, you might also tend to have uh, hyperglycemia because the insulin, remember, it tends to, to taper off. And then uh, when you administer at dinner again, uh, you might also have uh, episodes of nocturnal hyperglycemia. And uh, especially from uh, in the wee hours in the morning, it can also result uh, into a down phenomenon, which is basically just a uh, hyperglycemia. Now, when Lantus is compared uh, with premix insulin, we actually have two studies that have compared Lantus with premix insulin. So when you look at Janka et al., it compares Lantus uh, plus uh, oral antidiabetics with human premix insulin twice daily. And according to Janka, it found that uh, in terms of HB1C reduction, uh, 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 patients on Lantus, Lantus had uh, an overall um, greater mean reduction in HB1C. And also in terms of uh, hypoglycemia, it was found that it was, it was uh, actually markedly lower with Lantus. The weight gain on patients on Lantus was lower. Also, insulin dose used was, was lower. We'll see why in Lantus patients, you tend to use lower insulin compared to human premix. And also when you look at Taraskin et al., it compared Lantus plus uh, once a day and oral antidiabetics compared with uh, the analog premix plus oral antibiotics. So it's a similar situation whereby you have a uh, H1C reduction with a lower incidence of hypoglycemia experienced in Lantus. Also weight gain is lower with Lantus and also the insulin dose use is lower with, with Lantus. Now, uh, what if you have a scenario whereby you want to switch a patient from premix to Lantus now that you, uh, you have assessed the patient and you find that they might benefit more than Lantus? So uh, we have a study that is Hama et al. that looked at uh, 5,000 patients who are switched from premix to Lantus plus oral anti-diabetics. And uh, some of the reasons uh, in that study for switching from premix was uh, lack of efficacy, which accounted for 69% of patients. Uh, the desire for more lifestyle flexibility, which, which accounted for 56%, and also uh, frequent hypoglycemia, which accounted for 24%. Uh, percent. So in all this, it found that uh, uh, patients, uh, once they were switched to, to Lantus in only 12 weeks, uh, there was a reduction in H1C from 8.3 to 7.2. So in a we are seeing that uh, switching a patient from premix to Lantus uh, plus uh, oral antibiotic could result in an overall uh, improved glycemic control. And then if you look at us, uh, uh, again, uh, when you switch patients from premixed insulin to Lantus uh, once daily uh, with or without uh, prandial insulin. So you can switch uh, in um, four different Lantus regimens. You can switch a patient from premix to Lantus with or without an oral antidiabetic, and you will still uh, uh, experience a re reduced uh, H1C. And then also, if you switch patients from premix to Lantus plus uh, uh, 
plus one prandial with or without an oral antidiabetic, you also find that there'll still be a reduced uh, H1C uh, reduction. So this uh, goes on even for the uh, two prandial and even the three prandial insulin. So in a nutshell, uh, we are saying that uh, whenever you switch a patient from premix to lantus with or without a prandial, you still uh, get good outcomes in terms of uh, glucose control. Now, how do we switch uh, patients from premix to lantus? Uh, so, uh, premix comes in various formulations. You might have a premix 3070, premix 2575, uh, which are the most common. But uh, the 3070, I believe, is the most common in various setups. So for instance, for an example, uh, you have a premix 3070 and you want to switch uh, uh, this patient on premix 3070 to lantus. How do you go about it? Step number one is to calculate the total dose uh, for premix for that day. So for instance, uh, if uh, they were, le for let's say maybe um, 40 units in the morning and then 20 units in the evening, calculate the total dose will come to around 60 international units. So calculate the total uh, premix dose for that day. Second step is to calculate the basal component of uh, the premix. So the basal component in this case, if it's a premix 3070, it will be the 70%. If it's a premix 2575, it will be the 75%. So uh, for our case, since we have 3070, we'll take 70% uh, uh, of 60 international units, which will uh, come to about 42 uh, international units. So the third step is to calculate the Lantus uh, uh, dose for the patient. So the Lantus dose will be 80% of the basal component. So you'll take 80% uh, of the 42 international units, which will come to 33 international uh, units. So you, you'll find that you'll tend to use a lower dose of Lantus compared to, to premix. And also when you're discussing cost effectiveness, also this is also a point to look at in the long run. Now we have, uh, these are the supporting devices we have for Lantus. So we, it comes in a vial and a pen. So the vial is a, it's a 10 ml vial and it comes uh, with a thousand units of uh, insulin glycogen. And then uh, the pen also, it's a 300 uh, units, uh, international unit pen. So, you can, uh, I think Dr. York has uh, specified on how you can apply uh, the two to your various uh, patient needs. Now the Lantus dose, uh, it's just as per the guidelines. You start with uh, 10 international units and then you titrate with two international units every three days until you achieve your fasting plasma glucose target. If you decide to go the uh, calculation by body weight, you can use a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 international units and then you titrate with two units every three days until you achieve your fasting plasma glucose target. Now, how do you store an open lantus? I know this is normally a very common question that is asked. So um, before opening, uh, lantus should be stored in a refrigerator at a temperature of two degrees Celsius to eight degrees Celsius. So before you open it, you store it in, in the refrigerator. And then um, the next point is uh, once now you have opened it, uh, how do you store it? So once lantus is opened, don't refrigerate the lantus uh, in a refrigerator. So you don't put it back in the, in the fridge. So it can be kept at room temperature below 30 degrees Celsius uh, for a maximum of 28, uh, 28 days. So also keep lanterns away from direct heat and, uh, and light. So I hope we are together that before, before you open lanterns, uh, you store it in a refrigerator, but after you have opened it, you don't need to store it in a refrigerator. Now, in summary, uh, what are we saying is that uh, lanterns has consistently delivered early and sustained glycemic control for, for patients. And also it is associated with a low risk of hypoglycemia, even when added to, to metformin. It is cardio-neutral, so it has a long-term CV uh, safety data, and it's very easy to initiate. We have seen you just start with 10 units, and then uh, two units every three days, or 0 0.1 international units to 0 0.2 international units. Then uh, uh, another summary from uh, the comparison from premix is that uh, 
uh, they both, of course, improve glycemic control. But remember, Lantus is once a day, Primix is twice a day. And uh, with Lantus, you have, uh, we have seen that uh, patients with Lantus tend to experience lower incidences of hypoglycemia. They have also less weight gain and also a lower insulin dose is used. And then uh, switching from premixed insulin to once daily Lantus with or without a prandial insulin improves blood glucose control. Now, basal bolus with Lantus and Apidra. Apidra is our rapid acting insulin from Sanofi. So it's an uh, insulin glulysin. And uh, this gives superior glycemic control to premix insulin. So um, as part of Sanofi's commitment to improving access to diabetes care, we have uh, an ongoing Lanta success program that is uh, uh, specific to the vial. So remember the vial we said it comes in a thousand units, uh, that is a 10 ml vial. And uh, the, the price uh, currently, uh, it's actually been reduced by up to 75%. So you'll find in your setups that uh, Lantus vial goes for around uh, 1,200 to 1,400 marks. So um, you can, um, especially, especially for those patients who might have challenges in uh, affording Lantus, you can actually recommend uh, the Lantus vial uh, to them. So in, for, in terms of partnerships here, you can find Lantus. Uh, if you are in a mission hospital, you can get it from meds. If you are in Kemsa, if you are in, in a public hospital, you can also get it from Kemsa. And the private hospitals and pharmacies can get them from our private distributors, such as Sadifarm, Laborex, or um, uh, Highchem. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll hand over the program back to uh, Mbao. Mbao can take over. Asante Nick, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful uh, presentation. So we uh, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to go directly to the Q&A. Uh, we have not more than seven minutes uh, till when our webinar will end. Uh, OK, the first question uh, comes from uh, Dara Shah. Patients using insulin in Kenya have challenges in, refriger in refrigeration. Nico Mwango, just before you go off, how do, we, how do you respond to this today? Yes, I think Dr. Sokola had a very interesting uh, uh, idea. Dr. Sokola can handle that. Yeah, so uh, of course we've worked in, I've personally worked in, um, in resource uh, scarce settings where people do not have access to the fridge. And uh, the best thing that we used to see happening, because ideally if your temperatures are good, if you look at the, um, the guidance that is there, even up to like 28 degrees, basically from what I, I came across uh, um, is that the pen that you're using, if you're using a pen, then up to room temperatures, you are fine. You don't need a fridge for the pen that you are using. But for the, the pens that you're not using, then you may need a fridge, right? Or then the storage system. But here, I think what the person who's asking is targeting is use of the human insulin, mixed insulin, for example, mixed hard insulin. Uh, um, and how you would store that kind of insulin, which does need a cooler environment uh, than the 28 degrees that we are talking about, obviously. So what we used to tell patients is to use the charcoal fridge. So there are, there are several uh, options available, but this one used to work the best for them and it was quite convenient. So you take, um, you take a, a, what do you call it? Like a, a, how do I call it? Like a bucket kind of the ones where, which, you know, the, the containers that are used for ghee and all that. So you, you take a, um, uh, a, a, could I call it a jar or I, I really don't know how to, to, to define it. Like, you know, like those containers which you use for, for Kimbo and stuff like that. And then in, on inside that we fill it with, uh, with uh, charcoal. And then you actually put a tin inside that which in which you put the insulin and then you cover the charcoal with water and you leave it in the coolest part of the, of the room. So that way we used to find that patients can store insulin. Some patients put it in uh, spirit, you know, like uh, because when spirit evaporates, it, it uh, leaves a cooler environment. So they used to put it in spirit, but um, what we found working very well is this charcoal fridge somehow. And we used to really advocate for it at, at uh, Bagathi and even at Narok where I had worked as a uh, uh, physician. So I, I don't know what the experience is. Maybe Dr. Iwak can tell us also a bit. Okay, thank you. 
Now, uh, with regards to the um, storage after, we say that for insulin, you can keep it for 30 days outside at normal room temperature. So that doesn't mean that you go and put it on top of your GECO. But for 30 minutes, so what we need to make sure is that when the insulin is in our facility, we have maintained cold chain. So that while it's in our facility, we have maintained cold chain. Then when the patient has it, the insulin can be at room temperature for 30 days. I was looking for a document where we had the different days, 22 days for some particular insulins, but roughly they will not keep the insulin for more than a month at room temperature. But they, because sometimes when we, uh, we tell the patients to customize the fridge, some were, um, were exposing the, the insulin vials to to microbial contamination. So if the person cannot make a good charcoal fridge and keep the insulin clean, then just let them know that they just store nicely room temperature away from heat uh, and they can keep it for 30 days and they know when the 30 days will be over. And the same for the pens, because actually you are not even supposed to inject uh, insulin uh, when it is direct from the fridge. You're supposed to have rolled it on your hand a little bit to warm it. Thank you. Well, another thing I've seen, even for those who have fridges, there's a way that they're supposed to keep the insulin. And of course, like the pen, uh, with what Dr. Iwak also said, is you don't need to keep it in the fridge as long as you, you don't, you're not living in like, a, you know, extremely hot conditions or patients who are not having, uh, you know, summer at that time. Um, so, so in uh, most of these cases, even in the fridge, if they are storing insulin, it doesn't have to be in the freezer compartment, yeah? Or on the door because there is a, a higher chance of uh, air drops and basically of the insulin getting damaged. We have seen patients um, who actually store the insulin in the freezer. So you have to ask the patient where they're keeping the insulin. The best is in the vegetable box and the lowest part of the fridge. And ideally, you try to tell them that they store the insulins, you know, like they, they like I mentioned that they need to keep them separate from each other so that they can identify, for example, which would be the a basal, especially if they're using intermediate like NPH, and which would be the uh, mealtime insulin, or if they're using mixed insulins like uh, the human mixed insulin. Perfect. We, we go, we proceed ahead with the next question. Eh? And... Uh... Uh, Dr. Iwak, uh, okay, this is for you, Dr. Iwak. Are there any automatic insulin pumps available in Kenya market and which types? Can your insulin, that is now goes, now goes back to Nick, can your insulin products be administered using these insulin types? Dr. Ari, just tap, uh, touch on the last, the first part. Are there any automatic insulin pumps available in Kenya? Okay, I am not too sure. I'm hoping that we have somebody who has joined us from either CAM or the private uh, facility pharmacies but uh, i think in the hospital you can give insulin with an insulin pump but whether you can have that uh in the house in the home i'm not too sure whether we have commercially available i just tried to do a quick google and i'm seeing prices in dollars so maybe somebody who is in community sector can be able to highlight that yes uh, okay so in the meantime let's wait for that nixon are you able to handle the last part of that question Yes, uh, okay, the experience with lantas and insulin pumps uh, in the country is very minimal. And uh, okay, what, uh, okay, what I would suggest is that uh, I think lantas being a once a day doser, you'll just need to inject it, uh, inject it once. Uh, so it is just administered as a single injection. So um, my experience with insulin pumps is very minimal, unless someone else has an experience on it. But uh, lantas, we just give it as an injection. Okay, um, Nick, maybe I can also assist. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, for the for the insulin pumps, they use rapid acting insulins. So, for example, our rapid acting insulin, Apidra, can be used. Uh, Doctor Gaman Mohammed, I think, uh, does uh, have insulin pumps available. Uh, he does fit insulin pumps. They are available from Medtronics. Uh, but they cost uh, within the range of US dollars. That's why Dr. Iwaki are getting that uh, feedback. They are quite expensive. Okay, thank you very and, much. Uh, 
Oh, insulin pumps. Yeah, like you said, Dr. Gaman is uh, has been using it for quite some uh, some while. Uh, but main role would be in type one diabetes. There are also some patients with type two diabetes who he has who ha who are on insulin pumps for those with very poor control or high glycemic variability. But they are quite quite costly. I can tell you, for most of our patients in our facilities, it's very difficult for them to think. So it's like you are looking at costs of minimum of about 600,000 just to get the equipment. And then for the sensors and for the devices and, uh, you know, usables like uh, reusables, that one actually is, is quite, quite expensive overall. But they're available in the country. Okay, perfect. Oh, well, there's a question. Okay, I'm trying to understand some of the questions in the Q&A. There's um, George Waso. I'm not sure that um, the only question I'm seeing from him is about recordings, the, whether the availability of recordings. Yes. It's a question um, here about the maximum dose of insulin that you can titrate to. So if Dr. can take that up, but uh, I am, for some who are appearing as anonymous attendee, I can't tell which question you're saying, either you're not seeing the answer or maybe they'll post it again and write their name because I can't tell which question or if their question has been answered. Okay, Dr. Ari, well in, well in, Dr. Ari. So probably to, to handle the last, we have the last three minutes to handle the last uh, two questions. Eh? First, of, first and foremost, uh, we, are going to, uh, we are going to ensure that the recording is going to be posted on our YouTube page that is at PA Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. Uh, second, let's now go to back to the last three questions. Dr. Wycliffe Twaya is asking uh, how effective is uh, Lantas. Uh, and and Omongo, Nick, are you, are you with us on that? Yes, Mbau. Uh, so like uh, I mentioned, uh, the Lantas cost uh, currently with the vial, it goes at uh, 1,200 to 1,400 shillings, uh, depending on uh, the area. And then um, uh, when it comes to uh, the solo star pen, it comes at uh, 1,500 to 1,800 shillings. And remember, the vial is 1,000 units, the pen is 300 units. Perfect, perfect. So probably we are now handling the last three questions. So I'll give the last question to Dr. Sokoala. Uh, Dr. Sokoala, I'll give you the last question. Uh, a patient who is on ARVs and anti-TBs, what's the drugs, what is, what, what's the drug interactions accompanied by the cell? So you answer, you will respond to this question probably as you as you probably give us your closing remarks. I think Dr. Ayuak, being the pharmacist, would be the best okay. to answer this. <laughs> okay, Dr. Ayuak, respond Sorry, to this. I was question. trying to look at the questions in the Q and A, so I missed what you said. You are asking uh, what is that? Yeah, so Songios Kosge is asking a patient who is on ARVs and anti TBs, what's the drug interactions accompanied by the same? Probably give us the response to that question and your closing remarks. I think they will have to, I would encourage them that at this point, they can get the drug interaction checker because now what ARVs are they on? Are they on uh, t uh, t uh, t we say TLD? So it's good to just plot them. Um, if you look for that Stockley drug interaction checker or even just any drug interaction checker and put the various items, then it can be able to give you accurately because I don't know what regimens they are on. It's really <coughs> difficult, but uh, I would encourage you, uh, if you're a pharmacist, you should be familiar with a number of them, but you can easily Google drug interaction checkers and just put the various drugs. And then that one will keep you, give you a guide because it will depend on what you're taking. Okay, Dr. Yes. probably what is your, what is your- There's a question. Uh, oh, I just want to encourage people that, uh, okay, there's a comment about how endocrinology is a hard unit, I agree. And yes. I think it is sometimes it is interest that can make you decide to look into a topic further. So I want to encourage you, regardless of your practice setting, just take an interest to just learn something uh, and just apply whatever. One, two, three. If today the only thing you're going to do is apply the water, that you're going to greet your patients, uh, welcome them and ask them how they're doing, just look for just two things or three things that you can be able to apply to, to help you uh, improve your practice. I think it also helps build satisfaction and also invent, also impact the patient outcome. So just look for just one or two things that can make a difference. And uh, what it is we've not covered today, I want to encourage you, uh, at least these days in the world of Google, you can always find something uh, around, but you can reach out. If I didn't answer a question for some, it's not clear what the question was because a number of uh, people are anonymous attendees, so I can't tell which question was not answered. But uh, the presentation, I've shared it with Mbao, 
and thank you for your attention tonight. Uh, Asante sana, Dr. Dorothy Ayuak. My our sincere apologies for not being able to uh, handle as much questions, all the questions we, we are able. I know, Dr. Ari, you, you, want, you always want to respond to all questions uh, at the end of the webinar. So we move to Dr. Sokwala. Dr. Sokwala, uh, so does changing injection site goes with a change in dose? Yeah, so uh, the thing is, why do we change these injection sites and why do we recommend is so that the patients don't start developing lipohypertrophy. Like we said, insulin is an anabolic hormone and where you're injecting, actually it does tend to develop lipohypertrophy and uh, also in some areas, lipo, lipoatrophy as well, mainly lipohypertrophy. So what happens is that in those re areas then, the problem is that you're, if you're keeping on injecting in that area, then your requirements, you'll see that the absorption is reduced because there's more subcutaneous fat there. So the absorption is usually reduced into the bloodstream. So then what happens is you keep on increasing your dose. Now, when you change the site, you'll end up realizing that the patient is going into a hypoglycemia. So that's why it's important to keep on um, changing the site. So we say like to keep a one uh, finger breadth space, one to two finger breaths every time that they're using injection from the previous injection site and that they should rotate the injection sites like Dr. Iwak already pointed out. Asante, Dr. Ari, what is your passion to parting shot for tonight? So I'm actually very pleased to be here tonight uh, and see the enthusiasm of our pharmacy colleagues uh, towards this kind of uh, webinars. Um, what I would just like to say is that you are very crucial in the team. If you actually look at the multidisciplinary team in diabetes care, pharmacists play a very, very crucial role. Although, like I said, the role has been underplayed and now is the time to take that up and actually, uh, you know, pull up your socks and show us that you do matter in the diabetes team, yeah? And so uh, what I would just uh, advise each of you or request each of you is every patient you see who's coming and is put on insulin or initiated on insulin or titrated insulin, you should know the basics of insulin use, the injection techniques, safety of injection use, how to store insulin where needed, and, uh, and basically you know, be part of our team crucially, not just as uh, you know, dispensers of medication. Thank you very much. So Asante, Asante, Dr. Sokwala, our sincere apologies for not being able to have enough time to for you to respond, but we are much grateful for you for the time you have taken uh, to take us through. So Nick Omwango, uh, probably uh, one of the pharmacists is asking on my inbox, where, who, who are among your distributors in the pharma sector? Uh, which, where will you refer them to? And your parting shot for that, Nick. Okay, like I've mentioned, if uh, they're in a mission hospital setup, they can get the lanterns from meds. If it's a, a public hospital, uh, they can get it uh, from cancer. And uh, if it's a private institution or pharmacy, they can get it uh, from our local uh, approved distributors. That is uh, Laborex, Sajifarm, and uh, uh, Hikem. Perfect, perfect. So what is your parting shot for tonight? Okay. Mine is just to thank uh, the audience uh, for coming. And um, uh, I can see the turnout is quite huge. Uh, I look forward to for, uh, more engagements uh, with the audience. Uh, so we'll keep on interacting. Thank you so much. Asante sana. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, without further much ado, uh, let me welcome uh, Christopher from uh, Sanofi. Christopher from Sanofi. Uh, so probably, Christopher, are you ready with us? Yes. So mine is very easy, Dr. Mbao. You, uh, you guys have done an excellent job. You've handled the hard part. So mine is very easy. It's always a pleasure to have a start started, uh, you know, uh, panelist like uh, we had today. We had scintillating talks, you know, uh, having a retention of more than 60% throughout the meeting that we had with that in these more than 900, you know, it's, it's, it's excellent. I've never been in such a meeting and, you know, for two hours of uh, talk uh, of, of, of education and, uh, you know, uh, knowledge exchange that went beyond the times that we had set. This is excellent. And this is one uh, association that I want to associate myself with. So first, I want to uh, thank all, uh, the panelists, starting with Dr. Uh, Sokwala, for having taken time off to for this meeting, Dr. Iwak, and, uh, and uh, uh, Nick, as well as Dr. Mbau, because we know that you took time off to prepare for this, for it to have been as interesting as it was. I uh, really want to thank you from deep down my heart and uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Sanofi as well. 
for the audience, it's uh, it's very rare for two hours. I'm, I've been told that adults concentrate for maybe 30 minutes. After that, they switch off. But to see that we still have 630 participants on this call, I, we don't take it for granted. And to see the level of participation, it shows that you know this is a topic that was worthwhile. And you know uh, we, uh, we we know that it, we've we've seen a number of questions that have come up that still need answers. And I'll still, uh, you know, humbly request the panelists to stand with me and answer those questions. We'll send them via mail. So remember that if you need another another moment, uh, another moment like this, we are ready to sponsor this kind of uh, meeting again. And then, lastly, to my colleagues, I know there is a lot of things that go behind the scenes uh, to organize such a meeting, and uh, it takes also a bit of time. I want to start with our main IT man, Brian Maina. Who has helped us? He never talks in these meetings, but the kind of jobs he does, oh my God, without him, we are we will not be doing whatever we do. Stephen Juma, uh, Grace, Yvonne, uh, Nick, and uh, lastly, uh, Sanofi organization for uh, and, and PSK for giving us this opportunity. So with those very many words, I want to say good night and goodbye. Asante Sana Christopher. Have a good night and we are grateful. So from my end, from PSK, uh, na shukuru sana kwa kujia kwenye leo na kujitolea kwa kukaa wa muda wote tukiweza kuwasikiza wali uko wana tu, uh, tupa mafunzo ya leo. Uh, from the National Executive Council, that is PSK, Dr. Louis Mashogu, uh, President PSK, uh, passes his gratitude. Dr. Juliet Konje uh, was in and out of the meeting. She passes her, 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 her regards uh, to you all and also uh, from the secretariat dr daniela uh amakwamba lililo na mwanzo lazima uh, liwe na mwisho tumefika tamati ya uh, somo letu la leo uh, sina mengi la kuaga na kuambia alamsiki asante goodbye thank you goodbye